continue with Domain 11, Frontier Explorers. Today's story is called Red Cedars and Grizzly Bears. If you will remember, Lewis and Clark spent the winter with the Mandan people and met Sacagawea, who they decided to hire as a translator and a guide. Listen today to find out what Lewis and Clark discover on the next leg of their journey and how they kept track of what they discover. After Lewis and Clark sent some of the team back east with reports and scientific samples from President Jefferson, the captains and the rest of their crew continued west. They rode in two of their original paragoys, plus six new canoes made from hollowed out trees. These canoes, about 30 feet long and 3 feet wide, were hard to balance. More than once, as the men were getting used to them, the canoes overturned in mid-river, forcing the men to fish out wet supplies before going on. Despite this, Lewis wrote in his journal that the men were happy and healthy. Soon, they left behind the flat plains and entered hilly land. Now, the Missouri River became more difficult to travel. Forests of western red cedars lined the banks of the river. These beautiful trees were so important to the Native American tribes of the area that some of the Native American tribes called themselves the people of the red cedar, performing special ceremonies before chopping down the huge evergreens. Lewis and Clark knew it would be impossible to take an entire tree back with them because of its gigantic size, almost 200 feet above the ground. That's as tall as a 20-story building. Nevertheless, the, tr the tree was so important to the lives of the Native Americans that they knew they must gather samples and record its many uses. They drew pictures and collected branches, cones, and seeds. As they learned more about the western red cedar from the Native Americans in the area, both Lewis and Clark wrote about the importance of the western red cedar in their journals. The people and animals of the Northwest replied, relied upon the tree for their existence. The Native Americans used the bark of the tree to weave mats, baskets, and clothing, and used the wood to build canoes. Elk ate the leaves and shoots of the enormous tree. Bears hibernated or slept through the winter in hollow cedar logs. The men heard often of the bears called grizzly bears that made their homes in the hollowed out logs of the cedars. So as they made their way up the Missouri River, William Clark warned, keep a sharp out eye out for grizzly bears. One of the hunters said, don't worry, Captain. We've seen plenty of bears before back in Kentucky. Black bears, yes. Grizzly bears, no. And from what I hear... It's like the difference between a house cat and a lion. <sighs> One day, Lewis and another man were out hunting along the riverbank. Suddenly, they saw two giant grizzly bears up ahead. The bears rose up on their hind legs, up and up and up, until they stood eight feet tall. Then roaring, the bears charged, raising their rifles and taking careful aim. Lewis and his companion shot one bear, but the other one kept running right at them with frightening speed. Run! shouted Lewis, and the two men turned and ran for their lives. Lewis and the other man stopped running to take another shot, turned, took aim, and fired at the same instant. The loud was followed by a tense moment as the bear suddenly stopped running. It held still for a moment and then toppled over. Only when they were sure that the grizzly was dead did Lewis and his companion carefully approach the animal. Lewis later wrote in his journal that the bear weighed between 500 and 600 pounds and was eight and a half feet tall. That's taller than two first graders standing on top of each other. After this frightening chase, Lewis told the whole party, from now on, we must always move about and do even the simplest action in parties of two or more. One man alone going up against a grizzly bear could not stand a chance. 
and we will find out what else they discover along the way when we meet again.